so I'm going to introduce somebody who's very special and very talented, uh, Marion Keyes. She's one of the most successful Irish novelists of all time. Though she was, yeah, <laughs> exactly, woo. Though she was brought up in a home where a lot of storytelling went on, it never actually occurred to her that she could write. And in fact, though, she went on to write 13 novels, three collections of journalism and short stories, all of which have been bestsellers. She's now published in 36 languages around the world. It's amazing. And we're going to talk a little bit about her book, um, This Charming Man, how, and how she used popular fun fiction to debunk myths about violent men. And I'd just also like to say that Marion has been such a staunch supporter of Repeal the Eighth as well, and uses her very big platform on Twitter, 170,000 followers, to share feminist ideas, and also, most importantly, to bring joy. Would you please welcome Marion Keyes. <laughs> Thanks, it's lovely to be here. Oh, okay. Um, we're going to talk about this charming man. Yeah. And you write very, very funny books, which we all know, anyone who's, who's read them in the audience, they're hilarious, but you always tackle big subjects too. And you always leave us as readers with things to think about and to look at things from a fresh perspective. So in This Charming Man, why did you want to tackle domestic violence? Um, well, I mean, I'm looking in that like as a, a popular fiction writer um, who also cares passionately about the lot of women. I have a fairly unique opportunity to untangle um, very unpalatable subjects. And I I think domestic violence is a subject that people are terrified of. Um, I, the reason I wanted to write about it was I heard a very decent, good woman um, talk about fundraising for the battered women. And that enraged me because it is such an othering phrase. Um, I think as women, we are terrified of being a victim of domestic violence. And I think we spend, a, or, or, you know, as a society, we spend a lot of our time trying to um, other the, the victims of domestic violence and also to other the men who do it. Um, you know, there is a t-shirt, there's a vest called a wife beater, which is disgusting, you know, because it, it kind of perpetrates this myth that domestic violence is something that only occurs in lower socioeconomic groups, that it occurs only to people who are poor or badly educated. Um, and we think because you know we're educated or we are intelligent or we have a strong support network that it will never happen to us and therefore that we don't have to feel any solidarity for those to whom it does happen. I think there's also um, a wish in us as a society to believe that the women who are victims of domestic violence have almost invited it somehow and that because we don't invite it it won't happen to us so i you know because i write popular fiction i am able to challenge that sort of myth and to say a of course it can happen to any one of us and b as a society, as a collective, we need to feel solidarity with every single woman whom this issue affects. And tell us about this charming man, the character in it, who's the perpetrator, yeah. because he's very different to what you might in, yeah. this, in this terrible stereotype that we have. Yeah, he's, he's, he's good looking, he's a politician, he is educated, and most importantly, he's charismatic because that, that word comes up again and again. You know, so many women are trapped um, in a situation where they are being brutalized or terrified, um, and they try to tell their family or their friends about what this man is doing, and they are told again and again, but he's lovely. He's lovely to you, he is so good to you. And they refuse to believe it. You know, the, the charisma is a weapon against the woman. Um, so in this particular book, his name is pa Paddy de Corsi. He's one of Ireland's most eligible bachelors. And the, the story is about three different women. And they're very ordinary women, you know, and they're not your, like, forgive me, typical victim. Because I wanted to show readers you know, it can happen to any one of us. We're not immune. Um, and, you know, it doesn't just happen to women on the sidelines. And there's that other thing, almost, that it might be catching. So to, even yes. to engage in it is yeah. to kind of invite it in yourself. A absolutely. Um, you know, so many people turn away from the issue rather than face into it, rather than going, 
it's awful and how can we help? You know, we turn away because it's, it's unpalatable, it's ugly, you know, it's frightening um, and it's messy. Um, you did a lot of research for the book and yeah. as part of that, uh, something that's become very relevant and, and pertinent these days is course of control. Yeah. You kind of explored all the different ways that uh, women are abused in relationships that are yeah. not just physical. We've heard it here today at, at some at length. Yes. So what did you find out about that? Well, just that, well, in 92% of cases where a woman is murdered by a partner or ex-partner, it has been preceded by coercive of control. And coercive of control can take all kinds of forms, like, you know, um, punishing the children for the woman's transgressions, um, locking her in the home when the man goes to work in the morning, leaving her without food, um, taking away her phone, um, monitoring her time so that like um, the petrol gauge on the car is monitored, the mileage to see that like if she said she went to the supermarket, she really only went to the supermarket, um, checking the time on a supermarket receipt to make sure that like when she said she drove straight home from there that she didn't go off somewhere else, um, checking who she called, um, doing things like destroying her self-esteem by buying her clothes in a size too small and telling her that she needs to diet her way into them, um, cutting off her, um, her close friendships and her connection with family, you know, by telling her that they're not good for her or also by making excuses to, and also by perpetrating this kind of myth that she's hysterical, that she's over-emotional, that she's got mental health issues. Um, there are all kinds of ways that um, a woman's self-esteem is destroyed without um, actually hitting her. And when I was researching the book, um, coercive control hadn't been recognised as a, as, as a crime. And um, it has been now in Ireland, it'll come into um, force in January, but um, it came into force in Britain three years ago. And I was just looking at stats, and in the first year, um, 153 cases were um, prosecuted, which is a very low number, um, and it resulted in 57 convictions, and 28 men went to jail for it. But subsequently, um, in the two and a half years since, um, altogether there have been 536 cases um, prosecuted, um, 29 out of the 42 um, legal um, areas, you know, geographical areas in Britain um, have prosecuted. Um, uh, the crime. So I think it's something that is, that the police force are, have been frightened about because we are so um, weighted as a society to believe the word of a man over the word of a woman. Um, and so many of these cases are he says, she says cases. Um, and they are not played on a level playing field. You know, any woman that goes into this arena um, is already carrying, um, uh, you know, a weight, you know, she is not going to be given the same, um, she's not going to be viewed with the same um, belief that, that a man is going to be. So it's something that is, I mean, it's great that the law has been introduced, um, but I think it's something that's going to have to be watched and, you know, we're going to have to call out um, irresponsible reporting on it, and we also have to call out um, irresponsible, as it would seem to us, um, judgments by the judiciary. Yeah, I'm going to get on to talking about the courts. I mean, just to say, I was having a little coffee across the road yesterday, and I just by chance sat down with a load of women who were here at the summit, and just for the 10, 20 minutes we spoke, there were all women uh, in various ways going through the courts who had suffered um, at the hands of their partner, whose children were suffering. They go to, you know, and we're hearing this all the time, they're going to the courts for help and protection and get thrown in at their most vulnerable to like a quagmire of, you know, put through the ringer really. And just to hear them, I mean, we hear them, we read these stories and it's very easy to kind of move on, but just to sit with these women yesterday, I just, it really struck me. And then we saw this case, uh, a couple of weeks ago, which just enraged me, where this man who, whose wife had a protection order out against him was um, had attacked her and assaulted her in her home. And he got two years, but the judge suspended the two years and then didn't even give him probation because of the fact that it would damage his employment prospects. And she said that his feelings had been running high, as, that were, as though that were some kind of reason why you would do what he had done to that woman. And I think we see this all the time, and it's just, I'm talking to those women, yes, women yesterday, which just, is just enraging. Yeah, there's so much to unpack here. I mean, clearly, um, the judiciary um, have a very patriarchal view of the nuclear family, um, where women 
are genuinely regarded as the chattel of a man. You know, that women do not have agency, they don't have independence, and they don't have rights. Um, and that is, it's still okay um, for a man to have sex with his wife or to assault her because he's, she's his possession. Um, and also, the idea that the, the right of the man to earn a living carries far more weight than the right of his wife to not be raped or not be beaten or not be abused. And I mean, respectfully, I wonder, you know, about the prism that judges view their world through. I mean, they see it through a very privileged prism. Um, and it, it worries me, it really makes me wonder, should they be educated about the lives of ordinary people? I mean, judges are supposed to be wise. And they, <laughs> You know, they know about the law, but they don't seem to know about human beings. Um, and that would be something that it would make me very happy if we could advocate yeah. for some sort of change there. And I should point out, in case it's not obvious, neither Marion or I are legal experts. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So this is all coming from very but much anecdotal. observation. Yeah. Yeah, but it just seemed to me, again, from talking to those women, and you're all here in the audience, I know loads of people in the audience, there they are over there, have, have experienced... Um, various things at the hands of partners and, yeah. and, and, and trauma. And we need to listen to them because they're the ones. I mean, one of the women I spoke to yesterday has been in court 300 times. times. Yeah. What is that all about? Like, what's going on? And why are we not up in arms about it? I mean, we just came off the back of the Repeal the Eighth campaign. Yeah. And it incensed so many of us and it, it galvanized this grassroots movement. I really think the next grassroots movement has to be in support and solidarity of those women and all the women yes. in Ireland who need our help. We cannot stay silent anymore about this. It's our sisters, our mothers, yes. our colleagues, our friends, and our men in this want to help us too. Because men, most men, don't want to see women treated like this or put through the ringer in courts. They don't. No. And I mean, it is very important also to say that the most vulnerable time for any woman um, in an abusive relationship is when she has left or tried to leave and the man now knows um, and to to leave a woman in the limbo of the court system is leaving her at like uh, you know incredibly vulnerable to violence and death and the the legal system is is in no way protecting women who are who have found the courage to to leave and I thought um, Luke spoke so well earlier in the panel, uh, earlier yeah. was excellent, but as a journalist, you know, I, I was really listening closely to what he said. That idea of the why, that's what Susan asked, you know, mm. the story of the why and what's behind it is something that we, I don't know, it, it gets it becomes, left behind yeah. in the kind of sensational... Uh, it becomes a gossip story, it becomes a juicy gossip story, it becomes a juicy human interest story, it's entertainment at the lowest common denominator, like, it is... It changes completely. If a woman is murdered by a stranger, it's treated as a serious crime. If a woman is murdered by a partner or an ex-partner, it's treated as a, let's rub our hands together, this is a really juicy gossip story. Let's find out everything. Let's find out how great he was at the GAA. Let's find out how he snapped. Um, but like in any situation, people do not snap. Um, you know, a man who murders a partner or ex-partner, it has always been preceded by violence. These are not random incidents, and we should not be um, absolving the man and, and feeling sorry for him. I mean, a woman has been murdered, and she always becomes collateral in the story. It's always about, let's find out what went on with the poor man that pushed him so far. And it, I mean, it is difficult for me to, which was touched on earlier, you know, after Clodagh Hall was murdered, going around to that community, you know, people saying, oh, but he was a very good family man or whatever they said. I mean, that's what people said to journalists. So journalists go back with nothing much else yeah. to, to write about and, and they write it. But I really think, and I know guidelines are just a first step, but yeah. maybe it's not a good idea to talk about or to quote people saying someone's a fine man who just killed their yeah. wife and sons. Like Maybe that's not a good idea. It doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, um, Level Up, which is um, an organisation which has introduced uh, guidelines called Dignity for Dead Women, um, and they've gone to the Independent Press um, Standards organisation to try and change how um, cases like this are reported. They say that like every time that a murder like this is badly reported, it just 
it makes it easier for more murders to occur because it's absolving the men. And um, they, they, like, it's, it's seriously like irresponsible um, reporting kills women. Like that's a fact. The red light's flashing there, right. and I think, well, oh. I just think for a final note, I mean, I really mean that, and I know, Marion, you've been such an advocate for women, and you use your considerable platform to really good, but can we please look at all the amazing people in this room, yeah. the amazing people listening, and, and Safe Ireland, and everybody who's putting this stuff together, that we can have solidarity with all those people who are faceless, voiceless, nameless. I happen to bump into a few of you on, for coffee. I'm a journalist. I should know more about it. I don't as much as I should, but we all have responsibility to look after you, to help you, to support you in your fight against what is a really shameful situation shameful. where people are walking into courts who need help more than they've ever needed help in their lives and they are being put through all these loops to jump and, and do all these things and it's just it's awful it is so I don't know yes. that's my last word what's your last yes. word no <laughs> what Roisin said yes <laughs>